What you are about to hear is not, 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 not a podcast. <laughs> this is a global conversation recorded live in real time with real people, journalists, business leaders, academics, politicians. I think the term is a deep state. Oh dear. Investors, experts, diplomats, citizens, coming together from around the world to share their views and ask our guests the questions. If you would like to join this conversation or hear our incredible library of past conversations, please visit our website, pm101.club, and join the fastest growing conscious community on the free internet. Thanks for being here. Enjoy the show. Enjoy enjoy the show. 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 Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning, and if you listened to our first few episodes, then you know that over the last few months, my friend Justin Higgins and I and our friends have convened hundreds of conversations, sometimes more than once per day, with up to 30,000 live listeners and participants, where we hear directly from people in the news, in their own voices, in their own words, in long form, and where anyone who wants to can join to ask them a question, share their thoughts, or just listen. We're just now starting to release recorded portions of these conversations for the first time, and we're grateful to you for joining us. Today, we're excited to release a recorded hangout, interview, and audience Q&A we had with David Sanger, national security correspondent at the New York Times. He's a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner and a fearless reporter and investigator. For example, he wrote many of the first ever articles about North Korea's nuclear weapons program, He exposed the American and Israeli effort to sabotage Iran's nuclear weapons program with the Stuxnet attack, and after 38 years of covering complex issues, very closely watching global leaders, often from right across the same room, David really does have a pretty unique perspective, and we think is one of the best informed people out there. One of the many issues we talked about was cybersecurity. The wall between the cyber world and the real world starts to break down when you have cyber attacks on food, electricity, transportation, health, or election infrastructure. This wall especially starts to break down where you have conflict between states and where cyber attacks mean people starve, freeze, or face violence in the real world. We talked about how this is playing out in the international community. What's the U.S. role in that? We also talked about what the U.S. is actively doing here at home, as well as around the world, to respond and defend ourselves, and where all of this will go in the future. This topic has never been more timely and is right in David's wheelhouse. He recently wrote a book, The Perfect Weapon, also a documentary on HBO by the same title, which we suggest you check out after you listen today. As always, if you like or dislike what you hear, if you want to find out how to hang out with us and our guests live, see our upcoming schedule, or maybe ask one of them a question, please visit our website, pm101.club or pm101.live. They both work and will get you to the same place where you can find all of that and more. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. David, before we get into the the meat of the discussion here, which will be like a 30-minute interview and then uh, probably 45 minutes of audience Q&A, uh, my first question is about old wars. Do you have any stories for us uh, about Mr. Donald Rumsfeld, who unfortunately passed away earlier today? Yeah, it was uh, sad to hear that he uh, had. And first, thank you very much for having me. It's always great uh, to be on. I'm happy to talk about the books, foreign policy, cyber, why we cover what we cover at the New York Times in the world of national security and the White House uh, I should say, just by way of introduction, I've been at the Times for astoundingly 38, nearly 39 years. Um, uh, I've been a foreign correspondent, national security correspondent, business correspondent at different moments, chief economic correspondent, White House correspondent. And I'm actually back doing the White House now for you know, at least to get us going in the in the early days of the Biden administration, particularly focused on their their foreign policy. Um, I was White House correspondent when Rumsfeld, uh, of course, was uh, defense secretary for the second time. I think he's the only one who's ever had the job in um, non-consecutive form. Uh, And um, he was a pretty cantankerous character to deal with, as anybody who's read about him uh, knows. 
Uh, he famously had that that line: "Sometimes you go to war with um, the force you have, not the force you want." And I reminded him of this one time when he was very upset about a story we had written and um, thought that it was incomplete. And, uh, of course, he hadn't answered any questions for it uh, when we were writing it. And I had to tell him, you know, sir, sometimes we go to print with the story we have, not the story we want. And I thought he might, like, laugh at this, but he didn't. <laughs> um, uh, but the great story about Rumsfeld, which he told on himself, uh, which you'll probably read in one of his obituaries uh, in the next day or two, is he had this house out in um, eastern Maryland, uh, not far from where, where uh, Vice President Cheney, his good friend, and uh, for whom he had formerly been a boss, actually, in the Ford White House, uh, had a house. And um, he was off antique shopping with his wife one day and pretty bored until he found um, two Civil War cannonballs. Uh, and he thought those were pretty cool, and he bought them, and he had his driver load them in the back of the car, and he took them to the Pentagon, and he put them on either side of the big fireplace in the defense secretary's office. And in the winter, you know, the Marines or someone come in, they build this perfect fire in the fireplace. And I remember being in, seeing him uh, one time or another uh, there with a fire roaring. Well, one day he's in there with the new cannonballs, and someone comes up to meet him, who I guess had a background in ordinance, and he looked at him and he said, um, uh, sir, uh, do you recognize that those uh, cannonballs you have there still have their fuses in them? <laughs> at which point they evacuated the defense secretary's office, I'm told, and had the uh, detonation squad come in and take these things away. And uh, Rumsfeld, when he would tell the story, uh, used to say that uh, he was defense secretary, but that he very nearly was the last American casualty in the Civil War. <laughs> he also bought a house in Calorama while he was defense secretary, right opposite the French ambassador's uh, residence. It's on a small street, beautiful little townhouse. But his wife had purchased it, and he didn't realize he'd be looking out at the French embassy. And you'll remember that the French were not the most enthusiastic um, embracers of the uh, of the war. And he, like, refused to go across the street and talk to the ambassadors. <laughs> there you go. And they sold it as soon as, soon as he could get out of town. So. Well, anyway, enough about Donald Rumsfeld, but uh, but uh, uh, what, what, what an eventful life. And uh, while I, you don't may not agree, and I don't agree with many of the steps he took, a really interesting autobiography he wrote uh, 10 years ago that's worth worth looking up for those uh, who, who missed that period. Yes, I, I will look it up. Uh, it's easy for me to kind of second guess not having been in it. Um, OK, so let's uh, get into the meat. We're going to start with a few cybersecurity questions uh, from your book that actually relate to everything that's going on right now and also the larger geopolitical questions and then um ultimately we will go to the audience here again uh, the perfect weapon documentary folks if you don't like reading if you do like reading uh, definitely read this book he uh, quotes senator mark warner in it who's coming on our show um so in the book you make the point that it will be a decade before we can quote reasonably defend our most critical infrastructure from a devastating cyber attack End quote. What do we do in the meantime if we can't defend hmm. ourselves? Good, very good question. And you should ask uh, Senator Warner that too, and ask him about the book, which he spent a lot of time on. He was, he's in the book, and he's also in the HBO documentary, which came out in October uh, by the same name, The Perfect Weapon. And um, uh, when the book came out, I went in to see him one day for a cup of coffee, and he said, You know, there are seven or eight things in there that. Um, uh, you know, they've had to take me into like secret rooms and, you know, lock me up to tell me about. It. And I'm shocked to read them in the book. And I said, oh, yeah, what were they? And he said, I can't tell you. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so great question. So we live in what um, Michael Sulmeyer, uh, who previously ran Harvard Cyber Program and then was in um, uh, Cyber Command and uh, and at the White House at the beginning of the uh, Biden administration, uh, would always call the glassiest house. And the problem with living in the glassiest house is that anybody with a rock can walk by and, and bust open the windows. And that's been our cyber problem, right? It's that 85% um, roughly 
of the infrastructure, cyber infrastructure in the United States, the networks, so forth, are all in private hands. So things that many countries might keep in um, uh, public uh, hands, not that that would necessarily make them any safer, are in the hands of private companies, whether it's utilities or, as we learned two months ago, the colonial um, pipeline, or uh, whether it is the financial markets. And these are all right targets for any attacker, whether that attacker is a state sponsor. Uh, a state attacker, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, somebody else, or whether they are a for-profit hacker who's just trying to make a buck, like the ransomware gangs. And uh, our defensive problem is that um, the United States government can't really mandate what those defenses should look like. And frankly, you don't want to be paying to have the U.S. government um go protect every network and node in the U.S. You want Citibank to pay to protect your financial data, and you want the utility company to protect your electric grid. And so you don't necessarily want the government into each one of these, and not all of them need the same level of protection. The banks and utilities need a lot and have spent a lot, but a lot of other places don't think they need protection, and perhaps they're right until that day they walk in and they discover that all their data has been locked up and they have this note suggesting that they dropped 60 Bitcoin into um, some account on the dark web. Or they discover that the Chinese have cleaned them out. So we can sit around and pride ourselves on the fact that we have the best offensive cyber operation in the world. And while it's quite good, it's probably not as far ahead of the Russians and the Chinese as it used to be. But if you've got the glassiest house, if basically anybody can get at your soft underbelly, having the world's greatest offense isn't necessarily much of a, um, uh, of, of a solace to you. And we're frequently limited in how we use our offensive capability because we're a democracy, and we don't, we're not going to do um, uh, random, widespread attacks. We're going to do only narrow, targeted attacks proportionate to the way we were attacked, and our adversaries know it. So, you in the book, you also proposed. Uh, quote, we need a Manhattan project to lock down our most critical systems, quote, for cyber, uh, and especially for somebody like me in, in the audience who maybe aren't <laughs> nearly the experts that you are. What does that look like? Well, it's a good, what's, the, what's the Manhattan project look like? Or what do those areas look like? The, the areas and, and maybe the way that you see this actually potentially coming to pass, coming sure. to fruition. So um, the areas of critical infrastructure, um, one can argue about what should or shouldn't be on the list, but there is a list. And it was developed by CISA, the uh, computer, uh, the cyber infrastructure uh, uh, and security, uh, cybersecurity agency. And um, they are part of the Department of Homeland Security. And if you're wondering about that list, it was handed by President Biden two weeks ago today to President Putin in Geneva. And he basically said, this is our red line. Things on this list, if attacked, will result in a um, very big reaction. Now, it's an interesting and worthwhile threat to make. It's good to be able to have something to show the Russian president and say it is off limits. But it's also worth remembering that a lot of things on that list have been attacked before and no one's done anything about it. As you'll see in the documentary and see described in the book, um, the North Koreans went after Sony uh, Pictures Entertainment, melted down 70% of their computer infrastructure uh, out in Hollywood because they didn't like a movie, a really bad movie, I should concede. Uh, it wasn't that, good. <laughs> uh, it, really, it really was not good. Um, 
uh, that envisioned the assassination of Kim Jong-un, the North Korean leader. And when Sony wouldn't pull it, they sent a team to uh, basically melt down their computers and did so quite successfully. But um, uh, movies and entertainment, believe it or not, are on the CISL list. Don't ask me why, but they are. Um, uh, the Iranians went after a casino in um, uh, in Las Vegas. Casinos are not on the list. Uh, the Russians went after, but but they also went after some dams and financial institutions, which are. The Russians went after uh, our election system in 2016. That wasn't on the list until the end of the Obama administration, but they stuck it on on the way out the door. Um, I could go on. So one way to think about the Manhattan Project I refer to is a way of locking down those things you care about the most. And here, you know, just think about your house, right? I mean, you keep uh, locks on the door to keep sort of ordinary street crime going by. But if you have something you really want to protect, you may put it in a safe deposit box or you may bury it under your backyard or do something non-obvious with it. So there are priorities um, out there. Um, the Manhattan Project can't stop there, though, because we need to build an understanding of deterrence the way in the nuclear age, uh, our predecessors built a concept of deterrence that largely worked. The problem is what works in nuclear does not work in cyber for all kinds of reasons. We can go explore a little bit later on. Uh, and the third thing you need to do is you need to set up a diplomatic structure of incentives and disincentives and get allies on board to your definitions about what's off limits and what's not and stick by what's off limits or not yourself. And that all requires some pretty heavy lifting. So if we were all to sort of gather together and say, what should be on our list? What are things that we should all agree that we and the Russians won't attack? Well, we'd probably all say the electric grid. That's a good start. Um, election systems. Who wouldn't sign up to that after what we've been through for the past four and a half years? Um, water supplies. Um, we could go on and on. But then someone's going to show up from the U.S. intelligence agencies at some point and say, well, wait a minute, before we constrain the president, uh, in the future from using these weapons. Let's think about this. Do you really want to make election systems off limits if we could keep a Maduro-like figure from taking office rather than have to go face what we've had to go deal with in the past few years? Um, for the electric grid, yeah, it'd be nice not to attack electric grids, but anybody here uh, hear about Nitro Zeus? That was the code name for the U.S. plan to take down uh, Iran's uh, electric grid if things had gone bad w before the 2015 um, nuclear agreement, and we found ourselves in a conflict with Iran. And people concluded that that would probably cost a lot le fewer lives uh, than bombing them. So there are moments where I think it will be the United States that will be hesitant to give up some of the capability. That makes sense, and that's a... <clears throat> Folks, uh, Mr. David Sanger here, obviously extremely respected journalist here for the New York Times. He's also an author of The Perfect Weapon HBO documentary as well. Uh, I do suggest you check both of them out. Uh, I liked the book. I haven't had a chance to check out the documentary, uh, but I will after this chat. On that note, I want to segue into now uh, kind of get into Russia and more so foreign policy. Um, so we have sanctioned uh, the crap out of Russia. I think that that's the uh, technical term here. Mm -hmm. uh, we, <laughs> um, we've had we've had a lot of different experts on the show. Um, and one of them, I, I want to ask you a question about a little bit later too. Um, but uh, they they basically all point to unilaterally, we are kind of at our limit with sanctions to Russia. So my question is kind of a twofold question here. Uh, have we accomplished the goals of sanctioning Russia for a variety of things? The cyber attacks you mentioned, invading Ukraine, a whole host of other things too. Uh, and if not, 
um, if we have not accomplished those goals, do we actually have any mechanisms that aren't way over the top and disproportionate, like you had mentioned, that could be used to deter Russia from screwing with our elections, from doing stuff that we don't like? We just just stop poking us in the eye. Um, yes, of course we do. The question is, is it wise to use them? So as your question suggests, um, we've all got sanctions fatigue at this point. You know, we sanctioned the Russians after they annexed Crimea and attacked parts of um, Ukraine and threw them out of the, the what was then the G8, now the G7. And that all made all of us feel good. But here we are seven years later and the Russians are still in uh, have still annexed uh, Crimea. They're still messing around in Ukraine. And you have to ask yourself the question, what do you do when the sanction you've tried doesn't work, doesn't result in the behavior that you're trying to encourage? And I know people make all kinds of arguments that just because they're still in Crimea doesn't mean the sanctions weren't effective. But in the end, they did not lead to the foreign policy outcome that you were trying to get to. Are there things that we could do to cause greater pain? Yes. And I think that Biden probably hinted at a good number of those with Putin himself uh, before. Uh, we could go after Putin's own money. We could expose his um, uh Connections to the oligarchs. I'm not sure any of this would shock the Russian people, but it would be pretty embarrassing. We could go open up their internet and allow dissenters much greater um, uh, ability to communicate with each other. Something that would probably be more effective with China than with Russia, but is certainly something you could go do. So why don't we do these things? Because we're not sure that we will maintain what in the nuclear world they call escalation dominance. And you are messing with the nuclear power. That doesn't mean that in response to a cyber attack, they would go nuclear, just as it doesn't mean that we would go nuclear in response to a cyber attack. But it does suggest that there's always a nervousness about what you do if you're not sure that you can actually control the escalation. When Bob Gates was um, defense secretary and CIA director, he had a favorite phrase. He said, the three words least asked in Washington that most need to be asked are, and then what? And that's the question that usually ends up slowing us down on Russia sanctions. Fantastic. I think I got maybe two more questions for you. Want to get to the audience? Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we just have so many um, knowledgeable folks. Um, so, how would you grade taking off your reporter hat, putting on your analyst hat? Uh, how would you grade President Biden's meeting with President Putin? Um, it's you know I was just debating this today with. Um, uh, my co-teacher at a course I teach uh, at Harvard at the Kennedy School, uh, Graham Allison. And I think we both agreed it's way too early to know because it was the first meeting, right? So they're sort of first laying out their thoughts to each other. They're laying out some red lines to each other. They're huffing and they're puffing and they're trying to judge how serious they are. Putin clearly recognizes that in Biden, he's not dealing with a Donald Trump who's going to sit there and agree with his every word and defend him and say, I don't think you necessarily attacked the Democratic National Committee. But uh, he certainly um, uh, wasn't going to show many of his, his cards. So, you know, as a first meeting, I thought both sides did a good job not to fill it with hyperbole or threats. Uh, if you think of the previous Geneva meetings between uh, presidents and um, Russian or Soviet leaders, it was not as friendly as the 1984 meetings that Reagan did, where he and Gorbachev had lunch and took walks and talked about how you might uh, drastically reduce nuclear weapons. But it was probably a little closer to the Eisenhower-Khrushchev meeting in 1955 in Geneva, where they were in the midst of a Cold War and trying to see if there was any way to get out. And of course, six years later, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
How would you uh, view the strategy shift from the Trump administration to the Biden administration with respect to working with our European allies and also uh, the allies in the Quad? So um, clearly they're working much harder to get allies on board. Uh, That isn't that hard to do after the Trump years. Uh, I was on President Biden's trip um, to Europe and was on Air Force One on the first leg. And then as soon as he landed in Britain, he went to an air base that uh, has been largely used by the United States. But from that moment forward, you could sort of hear the sigh of relief. They know Biden, familiar character, probably the only human being on earth who actually enjoyed going to the um, Munich Security Conference every year uh, and and uh, uh, dug right into it. Uh, so the alliance building part, I think, was relatively second nature. I don't think any of that has been surprising. What has been surprising is that in his discussion about how we are in a world defined by autocracy versus democracy, we, I think, are falling into some language that is sort of pushing us more in Cold War territory. And how he's going to navigate that is still unclear to me. Obviously, with Russia, a country that he considers to be a disruptor, but not a rising power, not the existential threat, you've got all of the issues that we've been discussing and a few more. Their use of nerve gases around the world, their uh, efforts to uh, disrupt Western democracies, NATO, and so forth. But the real issue comes with China where I think it's fairly clear by now he's actually taken a fairly a much tougher approach than President Trump did, even in Trump's last year, when President Trump moved from the, we're going to make a deal with these guys because they're the ultimate deal makers, to they brought coronavirus to our country, so we're going to crush them. Um, but Biden, in fact, in what he has done to cut off Chinese investment in the United States, cut off technology to Huawei and to others, I think has been, while quieter, probably a bit more hawkish. And I'm not entirely sure that I understand where this is going, because while they talk about competing with China uh, where we must and uh, matching or besting uh, them militarily, They also talk about cooperation in a range of areas. And so far, I haven't seen many areas where I've gotten the sense that Chinese are ready to cooperate. Thank you, David. We will go to, again, folks, author of The Perfect Weapon here, also a documentary. So if if you're like me and you can't read, you can go watch it on TV. Um, But uh, we're going to go to Greg here for two questions. He's a super fan and he really helps out with this room. So he's going to get the first two questions. Greg, over. David, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us. Uh, As as Justin said, I'm a a huge fan. Uh, What I... I'd like to go back to the nuclear question. Mm -hmm. Um, Early in your book, you specifically referenced um, Henry Kissinger's 1957 paper. And specifically, you quoted him, and um, I'll probably mangle the quote, but something along the lines of, you know, the the easy mistake to make is is to try and uh, incorporate the new doctrine that is needed into, you know, into the familiar doctrine that we are comfortable with. That wasn't the quote at all, but I believe I captured the spirit. Yeah. Uh, um, so, and I, I think you made pretty clear throughout your book that you felt that we are at a similar juncture and we need a similar shift in doctrine. What, through your reporting is the thinking about what that doctrine should look like. It's an excellent question, Greg. And let me get, uh, for those others who are on the, uh, on the call, bring you up to date with what you were referring to. So in 1957, Kissinger wrote a book called Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. 
It actually began as a Council on Foreign Relations paper uh, where he was supposed to be sort of the manager of the process, and he ends up writing a book that becomes a bestseller that is the first time that somebody's gone to try to explain to ordinary Americans that the invention of this new fearsome weapon, the nuclear weapon, had not only destroyed Nagasaki and, and Hiroshima, uh, but that it had changed the way Americans had to think about their own security, national security, and foreign policy. And I had read this book when I was uh, in college, which was, you know, 25 years after uh, it was written. And I reread it as I was getting ready to write The Perfect Weapon, because I was trying to do without, and let me cut the caveat here, I ain't no Kissinger, and uh, I, I, I can't begin to do what he did. But the concept was the same, which was to get Americans and others to begin to think about how cyber, now the primary way that countries compete and undercut each other, uh, was changing the way we had to think about deterrence and changing the way we had to think about foreign policy. So I went to see Kissinger. One of the great things about being a New York Times correspondent is you can call up and go see him. And I told him I had read the book and his book. I brought along a first edition of it. He signed it. And he said, oh, he said, David, it was so much easier in the nuclear age than in the cyber age. Yes, there was the possibility we were going to blow ourselves all up. But he said, you know, at least in nuclear, you knew exactly who your adversary was. You knew where the weapons were. You knew who you were dealing with and how to signal to them. And that's what's missing in cyber, right? Because in cyber, we have state operators who've got cyber weapons. We have criminal groups who have cyber weapons. We have terrorists who have cyber weapons. We have ransomware guys who have cyber weapons. And we have teenagers with cyber weapons. And none of those groups sign treaties, especially teenagers. So um, it makes the deterrence element so much harder. Because what are you going to do? Say to a country, we're going to blow you to smithereens or blow you off the map because you have a ransomware operator who's 21 years old and trying to make a buck and took down Colonial Pipeline? I don't think so. So that's part of the problem of building a greater deterrent effect. And part of what Biden needs to do with Putin and with Xi Jinping is to get them to go after the criminal groups that operate from their territory, which neither of them has a real incentive to go do because those same criminal groups sometimes help out their own intelligence services. So that means that we need to do a bunch of things, which we discussed before, wildly ramp up our defenses so that we can have deterrence by denial. That is to say, if my defenses are so good, I can say, I'll throw everything at it, but you're not going to succeed, so don't bother. That's another form of deterrence. Um, if we can get all the allies together and basically uh, freeze out a country that is not going after cyber criminals on their territory, well, that's another form of deterrence. And we could go on and on with the list, but it doesn't look anything like the nuclear list. Greg, do you have a second one? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, David. I want to switch over to Ukraine and, and just a quick background. I was managing a major news organization in Ukraine during the Orange Revolution. And what our reporters were telling us when uh, Kuchma, when Alexander Kwasniewski, who was the former Polish president, went to Kuchma and said, hey, you know, you got to fix this thing about the falsified election. He said, well, why don't we just, you know, have another election and falsify that? So, um, but in the ensuing there's a 15, certain efficient logic to that. I have to a, say, yes, right? yes. <laughs> but in the ensuing fifteen years, I've been incredibly impressed in the way that the Ukrainians have learned to play uh, the Western media in general, and specifically the American media. Um, and I think we saw that with the run, the run up to the Putin summit. And I just be I would just love to hear uh, uh, f from from your you know what's your reporting on the chatter on 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 what 
the Ukrainians, uh, what story they're trying to sell at the moment? Yeah, it's a really great question. And if I spent more time focused on Ukraine, I could give you a uh, uh, intelligent uh, answer. They uh, I, and I, I need to go um, uh, do that and hope in coming months I'll have some time to go do that. Um, but I can give you some contact. I, 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 I'll just finish one sentence and I'd love to hear hear your your context. They they know that they're digging themselves out of a particular hole with Biden at this point, right? After everything that they were through with whether they were going to cooperate or not with Trump's efforts to try to um, get this through. So you have seen them be, I think, um, uh, uh, far more flexible in an odd way with Biden than they were with Trump. Now, tell me I'm wrong there. I'm perfectly willing to vote. I said contacts, meaning people you can contact, not contacts like oh. I would give you information. Oh, okay. Context. Go. Go. I see. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, they work hard to spin us, uh, but um, they are um, hardly the only ones. You know, the Israelis are pretty good at it, too. And the Turks are pretty good at it, too. And particularly at the beginning of an administration where everybody's feeling their way, there's a huge rush on to both set the dialogue and the terms of debate. And also to um, try to figure out, you know, who's on their side. And um, I think for the Ukrainians, that's been uh, a pretty complex issue. And they are riven with their own internal uh, battles right now over everything from corruption to Russian influence that has really, I think, to some degree muddled uh, their ability to go convey a, a clear line to Washington. Thank you for that, Greg. We will go uh, to Mr. John Gunnison and then uh, Duke. John, over to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us, David. I would like to ask you a question about something that's the subject of much of your work, which is U.S.-Iran policy. So mm -hmm. the previous administration adopted a quite aggressive sanctions regime against Iran. But U.S. prosecutors uncovered a large-scale sanctions evasion scheme in Turkey centered around the publicly owned enterprise Hulk Bank and a yep. gold trader named Reza Zarab. And uh, New York Times reporters like Eric Lipton have done essential work exposing efforts by the recent president and the attorney general, William Barr, and others to shut down that investigation and prosecution, including by firing the uh, uh, Southern District of New York uh, U.S. attorney, William Berman, and other methods. And I'm wondering, uh, as we kind of evaluate uh, the maximum pressure campaign, um, how do we assess the efforts to enable or shut down uh, prosecution of the largest scheme to evade Iran sanctions? And how come that isn't a bigger part of the story as we look at the maximum pressure campaign and U.S.-Iran policy in that period? I, I think you've got to separate. It's a very good question. I think you have to separate out two different things. The first is was the maximum pressure campaign a useful tool to get the Iranians to do what it was that the Trump administration said they were going to get them to do? And remember that when Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, which was a little over three years ago, the theory that we got, and Mike Pompeo laid this out in a speech, I think, at Heritage, uh, was that the Iranians would be so crushed that uh, they would change their ways, they would cut a new deal, uh, they wouldn't want to risk uh, their own government uh, beginning to fall. And so that there would be a, a really effective means of um, using the maximum pressure toward a specific political end. None of that happened by the time that Trump left office. So you can, on the one hand, change policy and say, look, maximum pressure didn't work. Let's go back to getting into the deal and still prosecute people for violating the maximum pressure campaign that when it was in effect. And I haven't detected that they've let up any on that investigation, but that would be a better question to ask Eric Lipton than to ask me. Thank you for that, Mr. Gunnison. Uh, next, I think, is Duke, and then Jim, and then we'll go to Terry. 
Hey, David, thank you for being here with us. Um, in the news earlier today, a report came out that a Russian-based VPN service, Double VPN, was taken down by a coalition of the mm -hmm. U.S., Canada, our European allies, and Europol. And we talk about cybercrime often as like this thing that just happens on the internet, but they physically seized servers and they actually went and like you know, build a coalition to like go and physically interact with something that was, you know, came out of Russia. So what else should we pay attention to going forward to get an idea of what the American cyber strategy is in relation to Russia? It's a terrific question. So this um, seizing of servers is a technique that we're seeing increasingly use increasingly before the election. You may remember that Cyber Command and NSA combined with uh, some others, including Microsoft, um, seized a ransomware group's uh, servers um, for fear that that ransomware group could be used in the election um, and uh, uh, could be used as a platform to attack the election. Uh, in the end, it wasn't, but we don't know if that's because they were so disrupted um, uh, in the weeks uh, beforehand. Microsoft has used this using court orders for a number of years to seize um, uh, servers and domains, particularly around the world, that were used to imitate and falsify Microsoft legitimate Microsoft sites as a way of luring Microsoft users in. And I think what you've now seen is that the government has ended up adopting a legal strategy that the private sector uh, began. And we wrote a lot about it at the time Microsoft was, was making use of this. Um, I think you're going to see a number of other steps along the way. We have seen the NSA uh, get a lot more aggressive about blowing the cover of um, Russian uh, or Chinese intelligence groups and revealing their techniques, publishing their techniques, so that um, they could basically burn the way that they operated around the world. Now, is any of this going to be sufficient to change behavior? I don't know. It's great at throwing sand in the gears. But I'm not sure that it's ultimately going to result in a reversal of course. We will go to uh, Jim, a former member of the U.S. Navy, and then Dr. Terry, who's a professor. Uh, Jim, over to you. Thank you, sir. And I apologize, David. I haven't read the book yet. I've got it on my list, but I generally get them during vacation time. So I'm looking forward to, to digging into it. Um, Quick question for you. Somebody involved around during the, the Clinton Bush years with uh, with critical infrastructure protection and um, and shaping the, the the a lot of the policy that was carried forward. There was kind of a buzz in the air, in my opinion, uh, in D.C. You know, after Moonlight Maze, after Titan Rain, and 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 really thinking that something had to be done and and a whole of government approach. And, and yet, you know, fast forward twenty years later, and the infrastructure protection list that CISA has is essentially the same as it was uh, 20 years ago, but yet, you know, the Colonial Pipeline comes up that again, because despite the millions of dollars that uh, the federal government and, DOD and DHS and FBI specifically have spent in partnership with the private sector and the infrastructure coordinating committees and the like, um, you, you know, it almost seems like the, we, you know, the, the, the infrastructure sector owners care less or are more just worried about liability uh, with with greater threats and and a greater spectrum of threats uh, on the cyber side, I, I would be curious as to your perspective on that, or or anything else that you've heard from from your sure. conversations. So, just parsing that question out, uh, Jim, and and the, the readers I like the best are the future readers of the book. Um, so, because um, that means we 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 keep the conversation going. Um, the um, just to parse that, yes, all of the issues we're dealing with today had roots back to Moonlight Maze, an early Russian uh, attack on uh, U.S. government, particularly the Defense Department and so forth. Thomas Ridd has written some really interesting accounts of, of all of that. Um, 
but today they're more complex for a number of reasons. First, we just connected a lot more things to the internet, right? So back in Moonlight Maze days, you know, we had internet connected systems, but then we had old systems. And now every water system is connected up to the internet and you could control the water system if you were one of the insiders from your iPhone, which is how Florida, a little Florida water system got in trouble a few months ago. Um, Colonial Pipeline would have told you that they had segregated the operational side of their company from the IT side. In other words, that you couldn't from their um, uh, business record side control the actual pipeline. But they ended up having to close the pipeline because they couldn't bill out where the oil was going, something that was being run through the frozen up system of the IT side of the house, or assure that it had gotten to where it was directed to go. So we're discovering connections now between operational systems and IT systems that we just didn't know existed a number of years ago, or we suspected existed, but we didn't know what those connections are. And there's a third thing, you alluded to it in your comments. We now have cyber insurance. Well, if a company can buy cyber insurance, they may be less interested in spending a huge amount of money in cyber defense because they figure if they get hit, they're insured. And the ransomware actors will go around looking for companies that have cyber insurance, figuring they'll be an easier mark. So there's a whole argument to be made that the existence of a cyber insurance market has actually accelerated the degree of attacks. So is the invention of cryptocurrency, right? Which is another way to assure some anonymity when you're getting paid. So those are all some reasons that bad as it was in the bad old days, it's worse today. (laughs) <laughs> well, Good good thank, th- th- thank you, Jim. Uh, we will go to Dr. Terry, who's a political science professor, uh, coming up this next semester at McGill University. And then we will go to Sam Buchan, who's a uh, former uh, NSC International Director of International Economics for the Trump administration. So, Dr. Terry, over to you. Thanks. And thanks for being here, David. I'm really appreciating this conversation. Um, it seems like with climate change and then these you know, attacks on infrastructure, we almost have a perfect storm. You know, we're seeing these you know, huge spikes in temperature in the Pacific Northwest, where I just was a few days ago. Um, and you know, the you know, blackouts and then the blackouts we saw in Texas, both not only when they had the uh, blizzard there, but also when uh, the heat is, you know, now they're having the heat. And so it seems like we have this fragile infrastructure. And then on top of it, the cyber criminals who are out there trying to, you know, create these ransom attacks. And so, it, I mean, we're just wondering, what is it, you know, how is the intelligence community responding to this in the sense that we've, we've got, you know, the probability of, you know, infrastructure collapsing just because of the weather, but also because of cyber criminals? Um, It's a great question because we've revealed a whole new set of vulnerabilities of which the intel community is a little divided about how they can go look at it because, of course, our foreign intelligence collection operations, CIA, NSA, DIA, so forth and so on, are prohibited from operating inside the United States. And our adversaries know it. So look at the most fascinating of the hacks on the United States in recent years, which was solar winds, the Russian attack very carefully planned out to go after solar winds, a company in California that makes network management software. Most consumers never see it. Most companies and federal agencies use it. The New York Times used it. Um, And this is the software that basically keeps your systems and your networks up and running. And the Russians figured out if you could get into the update of that system, in other words, it updates every few months the way your iPhone updates every few weeks, right? Um, Then they wouldn't need to have passwords or anything. They could basically be taken into the systems at a core level and be able 
to go seize them and seize data and conduct surveillance and maybe do a whole lot worse. Um, once they did that, they ran the attacks from Amazon and GoDaddy servers inside the U.S. Why? Because they knew the NSA and Cyber Command, where the much of the American expertise is, is located here, couldn't operate from inside the U.S. So they're playing off our own laws. On the climate side of it, you're a little out of my territory, but it is certainly true that you are now seeing the intel agencies and the Defense Department able to say what they wanted to say for the past four and a half years, but were told they could not, which was climate is itself a national security threat. Rising waters are going to lead to refugee crises. They're going to lead to uprisings and so forth. So we'll much greater heat. And we've got to figure out a way to get our heads around that as well. Both great questions, Terry. I'm not sure how well I answered. That was great. Thank you, Dr. Terry. Um, so we're going to go Sam, former Trump government official, uh, and then we're going to go Julie and Kylie. Sam, over to you. Good. Thanks, Justin and David. Good to good to talk to you. Great to have you on here. Um, so mine, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to pivot back and, and build on uh, climate, but then also uh, energy issues within the transatlantic relationship in particular. Uh, next week, Bulgaria will be hosting the Three Seas Initiative Summit, uh, so a mm -hmm. high-level event focused on diversification and infrastructure build-out. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's largely, for those who don't know in the audience, a counter to the 16 plus 1 initiative, which was built up by the Chinese CCP. But um, one of the things that, uh, that I was working on within the Three Seas Initiative was making sure that the U.S. Development Finance Corporation could be a participant. So that took the form of outlining $300 million in an initial tranche financing well, that would be handed over to the, the fund managers um, to, to use at their discretion on uh, specifically energy infrastructure projects. Now, there's been a stall, a pretty uh, long one, on the distribution of those funds. And in my best guess is that that comes down to a debate between the climate hawks and the foreign policy hawks within the Biden administration. Because once you send $300 million over to a part of the world that is exceedingly reliant upon Russian oil and natural gas supplies um, and uh, Chinese solar and wind um, technologies, then it creates uh, – you, you don't have the reins anymore. Um, so I'm just wondering, how do you see the, the Biden administration navigating this moving forward when – we do have geopolitical hotbeds like uh, Central and Eastern Europe um, that can't necessarily make the massive leap that that the U.S. And, and Western Europe are able to and need to diversify fossil supplies. Thank so you. it's a great question, Sam. And uh, my guess is that your time at NSC and in EC, you probably have um, more formed opinions on it than I do. But one observation about this administration in dealing with these kinds of issues, they are torn on them in several arenas. You saw it in Nord Stream 2, where, uh, you know, they oppose um, the Europeans relying on Russian gas, but then wouldn't sanction the German companies because they said basically the pipelines are nearly all built. In this case, the $300 million, significant as it is, um, my guess is is probably dwarfed by um, the money that's being thrown around by some of our geopolitical um, competitors. And I think part of the difficulty that Biden is going to have to go face in his autocracy versus democracy case is, are we willing to put our money where our ideology is here? You know, there was a time back in the 1950s where we could use the Peace Corps, foreign aid, or what became the Peace Corps, I should say, and foreign aid and so forth, to sort of win over friends and wire up countries. But that is the model the Chinese are using with such great uh, skill, uh, and the Russians to a lesser degree uh, with fuel, but the Chinese with wiring up a country with Huawei and then uh, networks and then offering them, you know, uh, 
the, uh, the surveillance package along the way, or the Russians making a country pretty dependent on uh, Russian fuel supplies as a way of keeping us at bay. And while we're spending more money on this now in the Biden administration than we were before, my guess is we aren't spending a fraction of what we would need to make this all work. And uh, so that's the big decision they're going to have to make because they rightly so want to spend that money at home. But if you're really in uh, a struggle for global influence with the Chinese, you better be willing to pay the money to get in the game. We're going to have a few more questions. The last question I do want to come from Dimitri. I, I'm sure he's going to have one, uh, but we will go to If Julie. Dimitri's asking the last question, then then my policy here is that I'm running out of time just before Dimitri's question comes up. Does that sound fair? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fair. I'll be quick, um, Justin. We'll, Super quick. We'll, we'll go Julie and then thanks. Kylie. Justin, thanks. And David, pleasure to connect with you this evening, getting to hear some incredible narrative. Um, my question is actually a little bit away from the topic we've been at, but um, Myanmar has been on my mind a good bit since February, since the coup. And I appreciated your coverage back in February, um, discussing how, you know, to the point again, we are sanctioned out over sanctioned. Um, part of me wonders, and I'd love your thoughts on how likely is it at this point where we're at the democracy be restored in Myanmar? It looks pretty grim uh, to me, Julian. I, I, have you done work in Myanmar? Have you, have you been there? And no, sir. Just uh -huh. watching the Twitters. Just watching like from the afar. Rest of us. Yes, sir. So uh, it's a country I really love. Um, uh, my colleague Nick Kristoff, now one of our op-ed columnists, and I traveled the country for a week or a week and a half in the mid '80s. Um, at that moment when um, Aung San Suu Kyi was still in house arrest, but, um, you know, you could see the incredible possibilities of the country. Wonderful, lovely people. Um, and uh, they, um, a country with huge resources that just is so painful to watch because while a small nation, if they ever got their act together, they could actually do really great things. And I had a little bit of hope when I was last there, which was with Secretary Kerry on a trip he took at the end of the um, uh, at the end of the Obama administration. And we spent some time there and got a chance to talk some more to Aung San Suu Kyi, who, of course, had sort of lost the sheen of uh, the great Nobel Prize winner because she too had participated uh, and encouraged this crackdown on the Rohingya uh, somewhat inexplicably. Um, I think what we've learned in the past few months is that the members of this hunter understood exactly what we would end up doing to sanction them. They made sure that none of their assets were all within our reach. Their assets probably weren't all that great, but in any case, they weren't dumb enough to keep them in the United States or allied countries. And, you know, sanctions are the last refuge of presidents who don't want to appear to be doing nothing, but also know that you can't use the U.S. military to solve every issue and certainly every civil war. And uh, so, you know, President Biden came out in February and March and discussed ramped up sanctions and so forth. But I haven't detected that it's made the slightest bit of, of difference to the decision making that the um, uh, Hunter went through, even though we've had a fair number of allied countries join us in all of this. And, you know, if there's any really great studies to be done right now, graduate studies out of these issues, it's an examination of where sanctions didn't accomplish your goals. We talked about an earlier one with Russia, and I'm afraid we're in the middle of one as well with uh, Myanmar as well. And we had actually on that point, we had Fletcher School of Diplomacy's Daniel Dresner on, and he was not very bullish on uh, unilateral sanctions, at least. 
multilateral strategy. Yeah, multilateral ones, you've got a shot. If they're unilateral, you're you're finished because it's easy to route you around. I mean, the classic example being that we would hype up sanctions on North Korea and the Chinese would just let a little more go through across the border. So we will go uh, to Julie. Then I do want to try and get Simon in. Then we'll bring in our ringer for the last question. Uh, Kylie, over to you. Well, hi. Um, yeah. Um, hi, uh, Mr. Uh, David uh, Sanger. Um, very good talk so far. Uh, my question is that because I came in a half hour uh, late, uh, so I don't know whether you have already covered this. But um, so back in uh, 2003, uh, China coordinated uh, cyber attacks on U.S. computer systems for not one not two, but three years. And this attack was known as the Titan Rain, and it was the biggest cyber warfare so far. And I'm wondering, uh, what's your thought on how U.S. could better prevent something like this from happening again? And also in terms of the severity of damage to the U.S. Uh, cybersecurity, are China and uh, Russia on the similar level? And which one of them poses uh, more threat to American cybersecurity? Uh, well, first, uh, on the attacks you're describing, they, as you say, happened nearly 20 years ago. And um, the world, what our networks look like, what's connected to the Internet, what's vulnerable and all that is so different. And what our skill levels are in different countries is so different that while it's an interesting piece of history, it's not comparable to anything that could be done today, either from the sophistication of either solar winds or the more recent Chinese hack into into the Microsoft Exchange system, Haftium, which was far more indiscriminate. Uh, and Dimitri can talk about this later on. And I would argue in some ways far more far, far more damaging. Um, we talked earlier before you came in about different forms of cyber deterrence, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and you can catch up uh, on that. Uh, but I would say that Right now, when you look at the cyber capabilities of the Russians and the Chinese, you have to recognize that they've got very different objectives. The Russians as a disruptor, the Chinese first were moving to intelligence gathering, then to uh, you know stealing industrial trade secrets and so forth, then moved on to social control what they're doing at home and what they've been doing uh, reaching abroad as, as well with um, their expat populations. And now, just in the past few years, the beginning of an understanding of what it would be like to be able to control foreign networks, not just use them for exploitation of intelligence, but actually for data manipulation, routing um, material through, through China. Uh, and that is the broader threat of having Huawei build the 5G networks and China Telecom running uh, points of presence through the U.S. that enable them to route data back to China and so forth. It's more of a combined technological threat than a single cyber threat. And then on top of that comes the threat of our own loss of some key hardware technologies, starting with semiconductors, which in many ways worries me as much as the cyber issues uh, do, because you've got to be able to basically have the foundry to, to build your most um, your own uh, stuff. And there, there's a sign of hope, because the Chinese have run into trouble as well. And, you know, we're all highly dependent on Taiwan Semiconductor, which probably is the best thing that ever happened to Taiwan because neither the U.S. nor China could afford the island's destruction right now. Ain't that the truth? Um, th thank you for that, Kylie. Uh, we will go uh, to Simon and then Dimitri, and then I'll give a recap, and then we'll kick it to David for last words here. Simon, do you have a question, good sir? I do. Thank you, Justin, for inviting me to speak, and thank you, David, for giving up your time. So as somebody who deals a lot with Russian uh, foreign policy myself, at what point might we 
see an understanding, uh, you know, from the State Department or the administration that the only way forward with Russia, if you want to have a, a better understanding, is to stop getting involved in Russian internal affairs. Thank you. So here's the problem. If you have, it's a very good question. If you have defined your mission as a battle between autocracy and democracy, that democracy must win, then by definition, you're going to be calling out and in the Russian eyes, interfering with anti-democratic, autocratic processes, whether it's fixed elections, human rights violations, use of nerve gases against uh, or nerve agents against um, your uh, enemies, restrictions on the internet, restrictions on a free press and so forth. And you hear this from the Chinese as well about you know, not interfering in internal affairs. It's easier for any administration that has decided to downplay human rights and say it's not a core national interest. But Biden's gone the other way. He has said uh, that human rights will be a core issue for uh, the United States and form its foreign policy. Tony Blinken has said the same. And at that moment, you've basically committed yourself to an interference in another country's internal affairs, at least in their minds. Because if you're calling out the jailing of Navalny and warning, as Biden did, that if he dies, there will be severe consequences, well, what's Putin to say? Navalny is an internal issue, just as, as Putin added with a smile two weeks ago, just as dealing with those January 6th uprisings is your internal issue. Um, if you decide to abandon human rights as a sort of moral high ground, even if you believe in it uh, as a tenet of, central, of American foreign policy, you could certainly make your life a whole lot easier with the Chinese, but it's not clear that you would still be representing core American values. So this is a tough one because you can't basically walk away from being able to um, interfere with another country's internal affairs uh, if you are also committed to making human rights and democratization a centerpiece of your strategy. It's just fundamentally contradictory. Thank you for that, Simon. And David, thank you. Um, okay, we are going to our ringer here, co-founder and former CTO of CrowdStrike, a very important cybersecurity company that I'm sure most people know about, uh, Dimitri Davis. Dim Dimitri, Dimitri, I'm delighted to hear you're coming on the show because whatever you ask, I get to ask one in July. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a deal, David. Good to hear uh, you, my friend. I wanted to take you down memory lane, if you don't mind, David, to your previous book, Confront and Conceal, where you broke the story on Stuxnet, the Olympic Games operation. And I, I wonder if you still view it as, con as consequential as you did it back then. Obviously, we're now well over a decade past that operation. And do you think it had a major effect on our adversaries or on us in terms of the development of cyber weapons and development of doctrine for use of cyber weapons? Uh, it's a great question, Dimitri, and I do. Um, but I'd be interested when we're all done with my answer to hear your answer to it as well. So um, for those who don't remember or don't know the code name Olympic Games, um, that was the code name for the American and Israeli attack on Iran's nuclear centrifuges started at the end of the Bush administration, handed off to the Obama administration, uh, recounted in uh, Confront and Conceal, which was my second book, and recounted again, but with a little more perspective of time uh, in, um, in The Perfect Weapon. What made it unusual was that for the first time that we know of in a really big way, two major powers, the United States and Israel, combined their cyber expertise to attack another country's infrastructure, but without bombing and without sending in saboteurs. And they used a cyber means to speed up and slow down the centrifuges, leading the Iranians to wonder whether, and ultimately those centrifuges blew up, 
leaving the Iranians to wonder whether it was bad parts or internal spies or a cyber attack or what it was. Now, do I think that we would have had a decade of cyber conflict, Dimitri, even if we hadn't done Olympic Games? Absolutely. The Chinese would have come after us for intelligence gathering, the Russians as well. But I think what it did was that it legitimized the use of cyber weapons in a very routine way, that countries that wanted to use those weapons anyway said, well, look, wasn't beyond the United States and Israel to make use of this. What do you mean they want some kind of cyber norms or whatever? When it was in their interest to stop the Iranian nuclear program, the first thing they turned to was a cyber weapon. And it wasn't the last because we went after North Korean missile launches. We went in using cyber and electronic warfare, Iranian missile launches after ISIS and so forth. So I think if you were looking for a demarcation line, certainly wasn't the first cyber attack, but if you were looking for a demarcation time that sort of started the arms, the state run arms race of the cyber age, that's probably as good a place to market as any. Now, you went through all these same times and watching the Chinese and watching the Russians and observing the Iranians along the way. What's your answer to your own question? You know, I, I think that it accelerated the development of the Iranian offensive program. They started really in earnest post Stuxnet. Prior to that, they, they had no program yeah. to speak of. No, um, no so, argument with that. Yep. Yeah. With the others, I, I, I'm... I'm Less sure. I think. I think you know. Obviously, we've been seeing Chinese attacks. Someone mentioned Titan Rain that preceded Stuxnet, uh, well, well before that. So, so I don't know that the trajectory would have changed. And one of the things that's really peculiar, both about both Russian and the Chinese position, is that they avoid making any attribution statements, including to the U.S. Their position is it is impossible to attribute cyber attacks, which is of course nonsense. But it gives them plausible deniability to basically reject all accusations against them. Uh, and, and, and completely ignore the evidence that is presented. So they have, they have not, um, to my knowledge, made Stuxnet into such a big deal as, as we have uh, in the West. But I do think that one of the things that um, we can reflect upon a decade later, and particularly in the context of major challenges, sh shall we say, that the Iranians have faced in the last year and a half, with their scientists dying and bombings of their facilities, is the limitations of cyber, that here we are 10 years later and we're still trying to stop the Iranian nuclear weapons program and they've made tremendous progress on it uh, in the last 10 years despite sanctions and everything else. Um, and the Israelis, in, in trying to stop it, yes, they're doing some cyber, but a lot of it is very old-fashioned kinetic, uh, killing people, um, smuggling explosives, etc. So I think it does show that uh, we should not overestimate the ability to achieve our strategic objectives using cyber alone. I think that's right. And I think if there's one lesson out of that, it's that cyber is not a silver bullet by any means. Um, it is, uh, if you take a look at the Iranian centrifuge production, I think one of the things that you'll discover is that it dipped in the year after Stuxnet Olympic Games. But then it came back up again, and they ended up building more than ever. So was it useful in knocking the program back and getting the Iranians to the negotiating table? I think it probably was. Um, was it the solution, the way to end the program? I don't think so. David, I do have one. I know we're way over time. I do have one quick question, though. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned when we briefly spoke on the phone that you had a story for us about Leon Panetta that we might not be able to get anywhere else. And uh, we, Leon is the Secretary of Defense. I apologize. Uh, do, do you mind sharing that story with us? Sure. No, and the story is actually it's in The Perfect Weapon. Uh, so I'm not revealing uh, any great untruths here. Um, so... Um, uh, it was uh, Secretary Panetta, when he was still at the Defense Department, who gave a speech about the cyber Pearl Harbor and argued that um, the United States, if it didn't increase its defenses, would find itself 
in a position of getting hit with a huge single hit that you know took out all the power from Boston to Washington or Seattle to LA or something like that. Um, of course, as we know, that isn't quite what happened. Um, we have instead been bled to death by short of war attacks that don't add up to a cyber Pearl Harbor, that don't bring about a big military response, because the great utility of cyber is to um, manage to uh, allow you to go exercise your power without triggering a military response. That's why it's a useful short of war weapon. And so one day I was having lunch with him out near the Panetta Institute. I was giving a talk out uh, uh, near there, and we went off to have lunch. And I said, Mr. Secretary, you know, when you gave that speech about the cyber Pearl Harbor, I mean, you knew that that is considered a possible but less likely scenario. So, of course, I knew that, David. But I learned a lesson in Congress, which is you've got to come up with a single analogy that's really going to make members of Congress sit up and pay attention. And they don't want to be responsible for the cyber Pearl Harbor and be asked later on why they didn't put money into the into cyber defenses or greater cyber offense in order to prevent that. And so his lesson there was forget the facts of how it is you think the cyber world is playing out. Remember what has some political resonance if you're going to get attention to getting it solved. So, David, um, you can leave us with last words on cyber, on foreign affairs, on the state of our democracy, really whatever you want to leave the audience here, uh, optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere in between. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's clear your dog has escalation dominance in your house because <laughs> uh, we can... We can, we can hear the bone being kicked around. I just want to thank everybody for what's a, a really uh, deep discussion. Uh, to those of you who I didn't know, I hope I um, was able to give you a, a quick sense of this. For people who I've talked to a lot, I'll be happy to come back and do a conversational in, the, in you know a few months when we learn a little more about the direction of Biden foreign policy. And meanwhile, I just urge you to... Um, not only keep reading us in the New York Times, but keep engaging with us in formats like this and in the Times and reader comments uh, in your own writings. And thank you very much for having me. That's all we have for you today. Huge thanks to David for coming out. Again, to Dimitri, the former CTO and co-founder of CrowdStrike for stopping by. And to you for being here and listening. If you like or dislike what you hear, Want to hear past episodes, find out how to join us live, maybe ask one of our upcoming guests a question, please visit our website, pm101.club or pm101.live. They both work and we'll get you to the same place where you can find all that and more. This has been Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of our co-founder, Justin Higgins and I and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon. Bye.